And now the fourth distinguished scholar from the University of Lisbon, Professor Luis Coutinho, please. Good morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the kind invitation to, to participate in this conference. It is an honor. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make a, a simple claim, even if, the, even if the argument cannot be as simple. Uh, the, the claim is the following. The logic of legal rights is still the authoritative logic of political sovereignty. In that light, it makes sense to consider them to be practice dependent, uh, dependent on the practice of law or on some concept of law as practice. The logic of human rights is antithetical to the logic of political sovereignty. The idea of human rights aims precisely at conditioning sovereignty, implying its persistence as a critical and reactive standard. In that light, it is problematic to consider human rights to be practice dependent. I will start by examining the first point, that is that the logic of legal rights is still the, the logic of political sovereignty. It can be explained if we take into account the essential characteristic of the modern theory of sovereignty. It essentially addresses the ultimate settlement of disagreement, moreover, on metaphysical matters, by an objective instance, that instance being the sovereign. This is a rarefied notion, but, but I believe it to be faithful to the ultimate purposes of the concept as designed by modern political theory. Theories of legal rights <clears throat> characteristically equate relevant normative matters with matters of rights. However, if they take legal rights to be practice dependent or dependent on some concept of law as practice, as in Ronald Dworkin, they can still be understood as theories of sovereignty, even if that may sound paradoxical. Explaining, when practice dependent, theories of legal rights assume the existence of an objective instance, a state instance, that ultimately settles those matters. That objective instance is the practice of law, our abstract and ethereal sovereign, in Ronald Workin's own words. Those theories do not deny the existence of disagreement about rights, as classic theories of sovereignty did not necessarily deny the existence of disagreement about normative matters. An objective, peaceful settlement of normative disagreement is the very axis of both theories, modern theories of rights uh, and uh, uh, classic theories of sovereignty. In, in practice-dependent theories of legal rights, that disagreement must be channeled through an objective instance, the practice of law. Before court's decisions are issued, in that practice, all there is are claims of rights. All there, all there is are hypotheses on, which, uh, on rights which citizens are encouraged to present in courts. Actual rights, legal rights, emerge in and through courts' decisions and thus through the said practice. I said above that practice-dependent theories of rights as theories of sovereignty find their axis in the peaceful settlement of normative disagreement. In the case of uh, theories of rights, that settlement taking the form of adjudication on rights. That does not necessarily mean that their purpose is exhausted in that peaceful settlement in itself and by itself. They may also aspire to a right or just settlement of corresponding disputes. The practice of law may be aspirational. A metaphor of the judge as Judge Hercules may be assumed. Notwithstanding, the essential point in all cases still is that there is no relevant truth on normative matters or no truth on rights, at least on legal rights, 
above and beyond its settlement by the sovereign, that settlement taking place in the non-metaphysical realm. Correspondingly, the sovereign settlement of normative matters by an objective instance is, in all cases, the essential condition for a norm or a right to exist. If one can understand in that light, in the light of political sovereignty, why the identity and contents of legal rights must be practice dependent, that same light does not apply to human rights. The point of the latter is not that normative matters must be settled by objective instances standing as ultimate authorities, namely the practice of law. On the contrary, standing for human rights means to stand by a normative idea whose categorical essence is that human beings as such deserve protection as to their basic interests, an idea which therefore aims at informing and criticizing the settlement of normative matters by objective instances. The logic, therefore, is not the logic of political sovereignty, being instead antithetical to it as it points to an idea which is transcendent to practice. The necessary connection between human rights and practice independency can be defended in historical terms. Human rights emerged and developed as a normative idea. That same idea gained track in the international realm as a reaction to practices of sovereign instances egregiously defying basic human interests and the basic moral equality amongst human beings commanding respect for those interests. A case could even be made for a connection at the level of the history of ideas between the contemporary per pervasiveness of the idea of human rights and the historical breakdown of classic theories of sovereignty. From that perspective, if an international practice was established around those rights, it could not have been meant as a sovereign unto itself as an objective instance upon which the normative identity and content of human rights would then be dependent. If it, if it had, it would have been not only naively unrealistic, but also subversive of the nature of the idea of human rights as a normative or regulative idea, one implying the, the prevalence of corresponding rights over sovereign practices against which reaction or at least criticism, should be continuously possible. The necessary connection between human rights and practice independency is not only historical but conceptual. It pertains to the very concept of human rights. That, of course, deserves further explanation. There can be, after all, different conceptions of the same concept, including of the concept of human rights. In this line of reasoning, the use of the concept cannot be disciplined as to its necessary pointers. That is, a concept cannot exclude in and by itself any conception of it, as long as that conception can still be considered as a conception of it and not, say, of animal rights. Thus, a conception of human rights as practice dependent, even perhaps a conception that is skeptical, about the, uh, the idea of protection of human beings as such, is at least preliminarily as acceptable a conception of the same as a practice independent conception. From an analytical perspective, that may well be true. However, concepts corresponding to normative ideas, such as the concept of human rights, are not only matters of analysis. They are matters of purpose, at least to the degree in which the discourse using them is not catatonic. That discourse is the discourse of individuals with intentions. Therefore, if a certain conception errs as to the basic normative purpose underlying the concept, the basic normative idea for which it stands as a concept, it can be conceptually inadequate. It can challenge something inherent to the very concept at hand. For example, a conception that ties human rights to the role they play in the international society as a shared basis of political justification, thus assuring the stability of the said society, 
may well be, from an analytical perspective, a conception of human rights. However, it is still inadequate, mischaracterizing the concept of human rights as it deviates it from its underlying normative purpose. A purpose that cannot be confused with the stability of the international society, being instead the protection of human beings against violating practices, even at the cost of international stability. As it is inadequate to understand human rights in light of international stability goals, it is inadequate to make them dependent upon actual international practice. That unless that practice had a purpose of its own upon which the purpose of human rights was dependent. That may be understood to be the case uh, regarding the practice of law and legal rights. As already pointed out, the former, as a sovereign practice, has the purpose of settling conflicts in an ultimate manner. Correspondingly, the latter, the concept of legal rights, has the purpose of narrowing those claims of individuals that can stand as legal entitlements since they were already settled within the practice and can therefore be enforced. That is not the case regarding human rights and the international practice of human rights. The purpose of the latter is not to settle conflicts in an ultimate manner, there being no point, no point which isn't contradictory with the normative idea of human rights in attaching them to an authority that is external to them in themselves, in considering them to be those rights that were authoritatively settled by a practice. In purpose, uh, in some, the purpose of human rights demands their authority to stand in themselves. This does not necessarily mean, I should point out, that there isn't a system or practice of international law within, within, within which there are international legal rights of human beings. Nor does it mean that the latter shouldn't, should not coincide as to their breadth with human rights as such, desirably being attempts to give them an institutional expression, in Professor Alexis' words. Still, the purpose of the concept of international legal rights, if there is such a concept, an assertion dependent on the existence of an international law ensuring individual legal rights, will be different from the purpose of the concept of human rights as such. The former will settle those claims that can be asserted as legal rights within international law according to corresponding secondary rules their identity and content being derivative. The latter points to rights whose identity and content is non-derivative from actual authorities or institutions, either national or international. What I've claimed until now, given the normative nature of the idea of human rights and corresponding concept, is that they must be practice independent. My claim, therefore, opposes those other claims that make human rights dependent on practice as to their concept and as to their content. Charles Bites, who makes uh, one of those claims, distinguishes three questions, one regarding the concept of human rights, another regarding the content of human rights, and yet another regarding the explanation for their reason giving force or grounds. As to the latter question, which coincides with the aforementioned purpose of human rights, Bites does not pretend the answer to be practice-dependent. He acknowledges that a practice-dependent theory cannot account for the normativity of human rights, that a human rights uh, is supposed to provide a reason for action. Still, Bites claims that the concept of human rights, as well as the substantive content of human rights, are practice dependent. That can only be understandable if one detaches the concept and the corresponding contents from their purpose, grounds, or reason giving force. If one detaches human rights from the idea of human rights as a normative idea. Well, that turns human rights discourse into something inert and deprived of significance, catatonic, 
using once more the same expression, as if the determination of a normative concept and the corresponding uh, contents could be made independently of its purpose, grounds, or reason-giving force. In certain passages, Bites seems to narrow the reach of his theory of human rights to the practical inference that are drawn from human rights. In one of those passages, he sustains that we inspect the practice because we are interested in the way participants understand the practical inferences to be drawn from assertions about human rights. If a practice-dependent theory of human rights considered merely the practical inferences that are drawn from human rights, not challenging a practice-independent concept of human rights, then my critique of practice dependency could even be impertinent. One cannot deny that there is an interest in knowing the practical inferences that are actually drawn by international actors from human rights. The point is that that interest is not to be confused with the interest in answering the question, what are human rights? Rights which stand as critical standpoints of the actual practical inferences taken from them, eventually also as self-critical standpoints of those who make those inferences. It is that confusion that seems to be made by Bites. Bites, it should be added finally, is overtly inspired by Dworkin's approach to legal rights and the practice of law, disregarding that the logic of Dworkin's theory of legal rights does not challenge the logic of political sovereignty, being, on the contrary, a corollary of it, something that definitely cannot be said about human rights. I've claimed that human rights stand as critical standpoints of actual practical inferences taken from them, being contradictory with the normative idea of human rights to have them as practice dependent. Against this sort of claim, Joseph Raz doubts that idea, taking into account that there is not enough discipline underpinning the use of the term human right to make it a useful analytical tool the elucidation of its meaning, not illuminating, therefore, significant ethical or political issues. I cannot seriously deny the undiscipline Raz refers to concerning the actual use of the term human rights. That indiscipline, however, may have been caused by mischaracterizations of the concept due to insufficient reflection on the presiding idea of human rights and its inadequate concretization. More fundamentally, the actual use or misuse of a normative concept cannot be taken as a reason for the disqualification of its meaning and normative significance. Normative, signif uh, normative concepts are not tools, least of all the concept of human rights, and thus the elucidation of their meaning and significance cannot be confused with the determination of their usefulness. Above and beyond, and addressing Joseph Raz's practice-dependent conception of human rights on its own merits, I believe it to be questionable. The same conception depends on a stipulated concept of right, which may prove to be inadequate regarding human rights, and ends up conflating erroneously the purpose of human rights with the purpose of the international sovereignty of states. According to Raz, a right depends on there being interests whose existence warrants holding others subject to, to duties to protect and promote them. Also in the case of human rights, the interests whose existence warrants holding others subject to the corresponding duties do not coincide with the interests protected by the rights themselves. There is an adversative clause narrowing their scope. But, Raz says, individuals have them only when the conditions are appropriate for governments to have the duties to protect the interests which the right protect. The adversative clause is ultimately based on the point according to which the reasons for a proper right to exist are not only bearer regarding reasons, 
that is, reasons regarding the protection of the person holding the right, but also since rights warrant holding others subject to corresponding duties, other regarding reasons, reasons that make it appropriate for others to hold the corresponding duties. This, this may well be true regarding legal rights. The reason why the latter depend on an, an, on an authoritative settlement may well be understood to lie precisely in guaranteeing that their recognition and protection is followed not only by the presentation of claims of rights and corresponding bearer regarding reasons, but also by countervailing reasons to be channeled by a fair and reliable institutional structure, the practice of law deciding on their merits. Both bearer regarding and other regarding reasons are normative reasons, and most importantly, others are not to be considered bound by corresponding duties unless a court or other institution so adjudicates, and that after their reasons having been properly weighted. If Raza's general way of thinking about rights may be uh, appropriate regarding legal rights, there are several problems in transferring that logic to human rights and thus in considering them to be practice dependent. First of all, it is unclear whether the other regarding reasons presented by Raz, state regarding reasons, since human rights are taken to be rights which set limits to the sovereignty of states, actually are normative reasons counterbalancing bearer regarding reasons. Since the, firmer, since the former are adversative reasons for human rights, uh, since the former, excuse me, since the, uh, since the former are adversative reasons for human rights to exist, and human rights are norms, they must be normative reasons, not reasons of fact or mere contingencies. However, in a decisive passage, Raz disturbingly equates those reasons with the contingencies of the current system of international relation, relations. Contingencies thus regarded in the current system as exempting interference in the sovereignty of states in the name of human rights protection. James Miller has already pointed out this anomaly and it is indeed difficult to consider Raza's conception as resistant to it. Subordinating human rights to the actual contingencies of the current system of international relations may even be considered, according to Raz himself, the very task of a theory of human rights. Trying, however, to read Raz's proposal in a more plausible way, one may perhaps consider that there are other regarding normative reasons which are adversative to human rights upon which their existence should still be made dependent. In that case, those reasons won't amount merely to the contingencies of the current system of international relations. The adversative reasons for human rights, state regarding normative reasons, are to be found in the, in the international sovereignty of, st of states, with states being considered as others to human rights a value not to be simply negated or annulled in the name of the interests which human rights protect. However, in order to consider state sovereignty an adversative normative reason for human rights, RAS must postulate it to be a sovereignty, sovereignty that, that is at least prima facie independent from human rights a sovereignty which does exempt states from interference uh, by others or from interfering in others even before violations of human rights. There is a conception of sovereignty possibly sanctified by classic international law as the law of states, but deeply problematic before the normative idea of human rights. From the perspective of the latter, in its utmost coherence, state sovereignty is conditional on the recognition and protection of human rights, with states not being considered others to human rights. Arguably, then, RAS betrays the very normative idea of human rights 
when assuming anotherness of states vis-à-vis -vis the protection of the interests corresponding to human rights. Again, an assumption that is necessary to consider state sovereignty as an adversative reason for human rights. With this, I certainly do not mean to deny that there may be very good reasons for the persistence of an international law discourse in which sovereignty stands as an independent value, a value which therefore may stand against the protection of human rights. The point is that those, those reasons, international peace and stability, cultural irredentism, self-determination of peoples, are reasons antithetical to the idea of human rights and not merely adversarial reasons for human rights. It is then incoherent and not merely paradoxical to have them as other regarding reasons for human rights. The case is ultimately one of incommensurability between a discourse of international law in which sovereignty persists as an independent value on the one side and the discourse of human rights on the other. Both discourses may well be compromised in the name of one another, but they cannot be coherently taken as sources of, of adversative reasons for one another. Moreover, and this is what is more per perplexing in Raza's conception, persisting sovereignty regarding reasons may be precisely those preventing the development of an international practice of human rights similar to the practice of proper legal rights. That is, a practice in which bearer regarding reasons and other regarding reasons are channeled through a fair and reliable institutional process, the practice of law, in this case of international law. With that eventually culminating in the sentencing of the right, which in this logic is only a right when authoritatively settled, and that after those reasons having been properly weighted. In the case of legal rights, when considering them to be practice dependent, one may indeed assume with a straight face that the merits of bearer regarding reasons and other regarding reasons will be so channeled and weighted, at least before well-developed legal systems that being the ultimate reason why they must be practice dependent. That is not by far the case regarding human rights, and that precisely in the name of sovereignty regarding reasons which tend to prevail in the international order regardless of their merits. It appears therefore derisive to consider human rights to be practice dependent in the name of sovereignty regarding reasons when these may be the very reasons preventing a proper legal practice of human rights. I should add that Raz clarifies that the adversative reasons for human rights are not only other regarding reasons but also reasons concerning the existence of impartial, efficient and re reliable institutions able to enforce the same. Uh, again, and given the above said, that may well be true regarding legal rights. But to make that same point regarding human rights means to make them dependent on something impartial, impartial efficient and reliable institutions that simply do not exist except very incipiently at the international level. What's more puzzling is that Raz, admitting this to be the case, we have nothing of the kind, he says, takes that admission to be the premise for the conclusion that one should refrain from calling for the enforcement of human rights at the, at the international level. In his own words, if enforcement is impossible, we should recognize the right is not a human right and refrain from calling for its enforcement. Interpreting, if a human right cannot be enforced, not because there would be no substantive merit in its enforcement, but because no ideal enforcement mechanisms exist, then one should remain quiet about it, abstaining in the first place from naming it a human right. 
perhaps hoping against hope, that someday there will be a language with proper analytical credentials, allowing one to express one's concerns, a language which, of course, will abstain from using the term human right. According to the argument made, human rights are neither practice dependent nor, nor practice dominating. What are they then? Well, I believe they are what they always were, a normative idea and a corresponding discourse. That idea aims at reconfiguring or at least reforming actual institutions, both internal and international and that by achieving a continuity between human rights and rights that are granted by internal legal orders and by accomplishing an appropriate degree of protection at the international level, ideally with a, sup a superimposition of human rights discourse over classic international law with a correspondence between human rights and international legal rights of human beings being achieved it should be safeguarded that from the perspective of the normative idea of human rights, one should never consider the above-mentioned continuity or, or correspondence between human rights and legal rights, either national or international, to have been fully achieved. Not only because that would be unrealistic, but most importantly, in order to preserve the continuously critical also self-critical nature of the idea of human rights, that being a value in itself, considering precisely its normative or regulative nature. Paradoxically then, from the perspective of the idea of human rights, the discontinuity between human rights and the practice of human rights, the tentative nature of any practice of human rights being any institutional expression of them to be taken as a mere attempt, was once again in Professor Alexei's words, is to be positively viewed, since it implies the continuous consciousness of the normative nature of the former. Thank you very much.